Hi, my name is Zelman Ainsworth. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Retail Stories. Today I got Kate and Cam Reed, the founders and owners of Loon Croissants, the world's number one croissant voted by the New York Times. In our interview, we'll discuss what it's like to start a brand from nothing into what it is today and the journey and process of creating the brand, the culture, the systems, and the sense of authenticity from a brand like Loon. There's a lot of great lessons and learnings from what they've done. Just on a personal note, as a father of four, I must say that watching these two siblings talk and finishing each other's sentences is really beautiful. They have a wonderful relationship that clearly has been able to come together to build something special and something that they're proud of. It's been a great experience interviewing them together and watching their beautiful relationship show through the camera. Uh, Kate, Cam, thank you so much for coming on to our interview series. It is a great privilege to have you guys here. I've known you for many years and it's been very few sibling businesses ever work out well. What's the, uh, do you have any rules? Like don't take work home? We take work home quite a lot, I think. You know, yeah. we, we luckily just don't live in the same home anymore. For the first two years, we actually did. We were living together and operating the business, and that was... Um, Cam was pretty much my alarm clock because I'm not good at getting up early. But... Right. Yeah, this one, I, I would, Kate would say, oh, I operate better on less sleep. I operate better on less <laughs> sleep. So we'd be getting out of bed at 3 o'clock, and she'd often be going to sleep at midnight. And I'm thinking, Kate, you've got to just, you've got to stop that. And then... Um, one day, one day out of many days, I wake up and she's not awake. There's no light coming from under her door or whatever. I'm like, oh, fucking hell. So I go and I knock on the door. It's like, Kate, wake up. And she goes, come in. <laughs> and I was like, Kate, I'm not coming in. Get up. I'm going to be in the car. <laughs> but can, can I just wind it back for a sec? Like there aren't seven siblings in our family. It's just Cam and I, and right. we're like, there's just under three years between us. We come from a really close family. Like we get on really well with our mum and dad still. It's just the four of us. Um, we don't have a big extended family. I think because of that growing up, we got, well, we got on really well together. And there was a big chunk of time there where I was living over in the UK. Then you were up in Sydney and we didn't spend time together. And I think um, at the time that I wanted to grow Loon. I'd been running it for say 18 months or so and it was clear that I needed some help and I had no experience in the retail side of things. I was running Loon as a wholesale business at the time and Cam had just sold a business and was looking for his next project. So I asked Cam to come on board and to be honest with you, like he was the only person in the world at that time that I would have trusted um, and like had the experience that I needed and we just, we, we like, we can say whatever we want to each other. Like there's no holes barred. We don't have to tiptoe around each other. If something's not right, we just say it because we've been living our whole lives negotiating a brother-sister relationship and the business partner relationship isn't much different. Yeah. So is it even responsibilities across the board? Uh, what roles do each of you play? And, and more importantly, who's really, really in charge? Directors, we both essentially hold veto power. If there's something Kate feels really strongly about and she just says, I really just don't want to do that. We don't do it. And the same with me, if there's something Kate really wants to do, but I have some uh, ingrained reason that I really just don't want to do it, she respects that. So we really respect each other on the things that we don't want to do. And we really listen to each other on the things that we really do want to do. I think another reason why it really works is we've got incredibly different skill sets. Like Cameron's very good at managing people. He's good at like looking at a site and understanding from a technical perspective what it needs, like logistics, maintenance, and then I'm very product focused. So we don't really step on each other's toes in that respect. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the reasons why we work so well together because we complement each other's skill set. So 2012, you're a graduate in aerospace engineering. You're working in Formula One yep. with race cars. You decide to put that to the side and focus on making croissants. Yep. How did that happen? And what do you do day one? So it's a long story, but I'll put it in a nutshell for you. I think um, I decided to study aerospace specifically because I wanted to design F1 cars. And I'd started to sort of follow down this path of baking, ended up in Paris doing the start of an apprenticeship at a boulangerie and discovered croissants. And they're like the perfect blend of baking and also technical perfection and precision. Like they're a really difficult pastry to do well. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I found my thing. So I arrived back in Melbourne, <laughs> For a while, I'm starting to plan what 
what this idea is going to look like. I find a tiny little hole in the wall in Elwood. Like I think it was originally a hairdresser's and then it had been some form of a bakery, but I, the lease, converted it into this tiny little bespoke croissant bakery. And day one looked like this. I tipped the dough out onto the bench because that had been my job in France, making the dough. And I looked at it and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what to do next. And I'd made the dough and I'd rolled the croissants, but that was like 10% max of the process. And I thought, well, I could go back to school and learn how to do it all, or you know, I could go and do an apprenticeship somewhere else, but shit, I've spent all this money and bought this equipment and I've got a bespoke bakery. I'm an engineer. Maybe I can think about what the perfect end product looks like to me and then just work backwards and reverse engineer the whole process. So what we do at Loon now is not classic French. It's very much the Loon way of creating a croissant. I think the other benefit, and you might want to talk to this, but because we're not tied to a centuries old tradition. Yeah, because Kate wasn't taught by a master who was taught by a master who was taught by a master. There's never been this mindset of Loon of that's the way you have to do it. Who am I to possibly change it? The process that we use was always Kate's. So Kate always started the process with the mindset that it can always be better. We can always improve what we're doing. So any tiny improvement, if it becomes, uh, if, if it creates a better product or a better process, that then becomes a new baseline that we work off. So how Kate started making them eight years ago to how the team in there is producing them today is totally different. No, it's not totally different. It's built, it's, it's built it's off the same principles, but it's been iterated and developed. And I think our motto is kind of... Like, if your goal is perfection, you'll always have something to work towards because you're never going to get there. And every day when these guys show up to work, if they can think of maybe a better way to do it than we're currently doing it, there is the environment and support within Loon to encourage them to try and test new ideas and things because we're constantly pushing for our product to be better. Yeah, if one of these guys comes up with a process that is better than something that Kate developed and can prove that it's better, then that becomes the new process. It's a real engineering mindset. It's not really a bakery mindset. So, yeah. There's a lot of um, young entrepreneurs, artisans that are still baking at home yep. or just about to sign their first lease in their version of Elwood. Um, what's your advice to them how to get started? Because a lot of times they're, you know, most times people get in their own way. I think Cam and I can probably both speak to this because while Cam wasn't there in the, the infancy of Loon, you've started businesses completely from scratch that were quite innovative for their time as well. I think the biggest thing is you just have to give everything to it. Like you can't take, you can't take days off, you can't take holidays, you can't think, oh, I'll finish up early today. Like you've just got to put blood, sweat and tears and everything into that business because at the start, if you don't give it the foundation and the push that it needs, no one else is there to do it. 100%. If you just want to be a part-timer, if you want to start your own business to make your life a little bit easier, it's just not, stay in a job. You don't just, just start a business to make your you life don't, easier. Just, just work 38 hours a week. You're going to make more money. You're going to be less stressed. You're going to have more time for yourself. You're going to have a better work-life balance. I honestly believe if you really want to be successful, you just got to throw caution to the wind. Say, I'm going for it. This is going to be my life. I'm going to step out of it. Like I'm going to say no to pretty much every social commitment that I get asked to. I'm going to miss time with my family. I'm going to miss sleep. I'm going to not have any money. I'm going to sacrifice all those things. And I'm going to fast forward my life. So in two to three years, I've actually got a really successful business. You have to be willing to do that. You have to be willing to throw yourself into You've it. You've got to build that foundation. And if you're not willing to put the work in to build the foundation, it, it's going to crumble. And yeah. like once you've got the foundation, you like, you know, well, you can then start looking for staff members to bring on, to like bring up the ranks, to take over some of those responsibilities. So you can step out of the business and out of production and actually into growing the business, which is where we're at now. But I mean, there was a number of years where Cam and I were doing like 70 or 80 hours a week together, brother and sister in a tiny little room, like in this room, just us two. So you've, you've just got to be prepared to like totally dedicate yourself to it. And I have to say the reward and the payoff is immeasurable. Obviously our croissant sits right at the top end of the market from a price point of view. This is one of the reasons that this glass room exists because we unashamedly price our croissant at that point because we don't skimp on bad ingredients. Like we source our butter from this tiny little 
region on the north coast of France that only produces a certain amount, but God, it is the best in the world. And we pay like top staff correct wages and we look after them so they want to hang around and make this product. But when you walk in here, you can see how crisply presented the chefs are, how dedicated and, and perfectionist they are about their job. No one even bats an eyelid at the price because they can see the effort going into the product and it becomes part of the experience as well. So this room, has, it's, you know, it's formed a number of different reasons like climate control for the pastry and stuff, but it's also to show the customers like that's why you're paying that for that product and no one questions it. But how do you maintain that level of quality, drive and perfection within yourselves nine, ten years into your business? And also, how do you teach and maintain that culture within your organization? Well, I might talk to the first part of it. Just, I think both Cam and I are people that we don't want to put our names to anything that's a sliding quality. Like, I want to be proud. Like, it's our reputation that now the business success rests on. And as soon as that reputation is tarnished, you lose your entire business. But personally, my own reputation, I don't want to be associated with anything that's not the best it can possibly be. And that's really built into the core value of our business. We hire people that have the same core values that they want to be really proud of the work they do at the end of the day. So it's, I think it's just something that is innately built into both of us that we don't want to do something second best. We don't want to cut corners. We actually want to proudly put our name to the best thing we possibly can. But that was also, you talk about the culture. We've essentially set that culture. Um, and when new staff members come on, they want to be part of this business because we're striving to be the best that we can be. And that's an expectation that we set of them. We set an expectation to say, we expect you're going to push yourself. And we have structures and processes in place to ensure that people are pushing themselves, that people are striving to be the best that they can be. So we started it by Kate and I just showing up to work every day and going, we're going to be the best that we can be. We've attracted people who want to be the best that they can be. And then we've put systems in place that allow and enable people to thrive and get the most out of their work. So now we understand the ingredients of what creates your culture and your business, but that probably answers my next question was, how do you build a brand like Loon that has that high quality that I know landlords would die to have you in their buildings, people queue up for your product. Often it's not an uncommon experience where you come here 11 a.m. and sorry, we're sold out for the day. So how do you I guess now you just explained how that all comes together in such a short period of time coming from the top. And everything you do is done in that level of perfection. The, the, the brand building, it wasn't a inorganic process. There, there was never like a focus group meeting where we're like, okay, what is Loon? What does it mean? What do we stand for? Who are our, you know... It kind of stood for what I stood for because it was my brand initially. And then when Cam came on board, it stood for what we stood for together. Like Cam brought his own values and things that he wanted to impart on the brand. Like I have to say the style, like the staff style when you walk in here, like they're all black. And even if you do somehow manage to find some fool to invest in you to put those 30 stores around Australia, you're not going to get any customers. Like we, we didn't create a brand, we created like a low priced luxury product and to go along with it, a low priced luxury experience where you feel really special obtaining the product and then eating it. And just naturally because of that, the brand has grown because people organically discovered the product, they organically discovered the experience. You know, they. Cam would serve them at the door down at Elwood and they'd see me down the back cooking and they knew that what they were getting was something really special. And then suddenly, well not suddenly, sorry, but over time, the name Loon and the Rocket logo just got attached to what that quality product and experience meant to them. Because it's authentic. And people people want authentic. They don't want they don't want something like cooked up in a marketing office. They don't want that or a brand or by, by a branding agent. They don't want that. They want something that's authentic and they want something that's real. And I think if you have a passion to create something that's authentic and that's real, you put yourself in a position where maybe one day you can have a brand that's strong enough to branch out. But you can't put the cart before the horse. But I'll tell you what, there's a bucket load of people that remember that loon experience that they had down at Elwood. And that's the brand that's carried on. Like, What would you say the loon purpose is? Like, What's your purpose when you come to work? 
And is that is that mutually agreed between the two of you? Do you guys have the same purpose when you arrive at work every morning? To create something that would give someone like 10 minutes of happiness or like when they woke up something to look forward to and it's not changing the world in a big way it's changing the world in a tiny little way but if you add it up for a whole lot of people then you are sort of making a difference what's most fascinating is you've done all this in two retail outlets yeah, yeah. and one's a small one in russell street which yeah. we got to work on together and then this one yeah. Um, and as to your point, people are rolling out stores after stores and they're losing the authenticity. We don't plan sort of a balloon growth. We plan organic growth. Like when we're ready for the next step, when Cam and I are ready for the next challenge and we know we've got the resource behind us, that's when we're like, okay, what next? And we look at the suite of options in front of us and which one feels like the right direction to go in. And when we both agree with Nathan, when the three of us agree, okay, we feel like that's the right direction to go, we throw all our energy into growing in that direction. We're, we're, we've got some interstate stores planned, um, and those interstate stores, they're just about spreading loom to that market, creating better workplaces, creating an amazing place for, to engage staff, creating uh, amazing experiences for those customers that come up there, and also a chance for us just to, to physically and mentally grow into that area as well. So um, it's, you're well known for being the world's best croissant voted by the New York Times. Isn't that wild? Yeah. Yeah. Was that your objective when you opened up? And how did New York Times find you in Fitzroy's? Well, like, honestly, I did want to make the world's best croissant, but I didn't, it wasn't like a written down goal. I just wanted to do the best I possibly could. And for me, whenever I set out to do something, there's always the opportunity to do the best that anyone's ever done. You've just got to continue to push yourself and keep trying. Harley Davidson started in a garage. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You don't need a huge facility with the best equipment possible to do your best work. You just need to decide that you're going to do your best work and you've got to do it with whatever you've got. Yeah. And that's what we were doing. We were just doing the absolute best that we could. We could. We were pushing ourselves to the limit and we were incredibly fortunate that we got the opportunity to meet Oliver and that he came down. I mean, that was something that broke our way and we were very fortunate. He hasn't come back to see no. this. Wow. And I would like him to see the evolution of the product. Like, yeah. forget the brand and the space. Like, I want him to sit down and have a plain croissant again and go, oh, wow, it's like, it is better than it was. So you guys are definitely trendsetters. You definitely set a whole new standard for cafes, coffees and pastries in Melbourne. If you could change one thing about the retail scene in Melbourne, what would that be? It's wonderful that we have an environment where so many people can have a go, but I think that potentially councils should just chill a little bit on their cafe approvals because there's only so many people who want to work in the industry and there's only so many pe skilled people who want to work there's in the only, industry. There's only so many people who want to sit in a cafe and have, yeah. a, have a meal out. I just think it just, it just spreads everything too thin. I just think that the, the chance to have like super amazing places you know, I just think it's just been diluted a little bit. I do think that it's like, if we speak to our business partner, Nathan, like Nathan is a real trendsetter and he's the one that really started this cafe movement in Melbourne. And like, personally, I love watching him work. Like I do feel like he's one step ahead of the pack all the time. And then there are just these group of people following him, like let's copy what Nathan does. And he's like, okay, you guys are all doing that now. I'm going to do something a bit different. And it's been this really interesting journey over the last 12 years or so to watch like Nathan just carve a path through Melbourne and, and really create the, the standard of what it is to be a cafe. Guys, thank you very much both for coming on this interview series. It's a huge privilege talking to you both. And again, I have six siblings. None of us get on like you guys get on. It's something very beautiful and you should cherish and your business partners as well. So it's a wonderful thing that you've done. And I'm sure your parents are incredibly proud to watch and see you happen. Our parents love croissants. Really? <laughs> yeah, like they, they've loved them. What a coincidence. Them, they've loved them forever and dad loves them. So they're just, I mean, they're just. Are they regulars? I'd yeah, say dad oh, is. Yeah, they're just He always like, finds a job to do around so he can probably come in <laughs> yeah. and get a free croissant and a coffee. Yeah, but they love it. Like dad's a real Francophile and um, I think the fact that both his kids somehow converge to making croissant is just the. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful story. To resist all. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a great inspiration, both of you, from creating from nothing to where you are today and how that perfection stayed all the way through. There's a lot of great lessons in here for me personally and anyone watch this, whether you're a landlord, tenant, or a business person. Thanks, I think if we can take bits from how you guys think and operate, you know, Melbourne will be a better retail scene for sure and a better place to live. So thank, thank you and thank you for your contribution. It's wonderful and one of the more enjoyable interviews I've done yet.
Oh, amazing. Really? Lovely to Thanks. chat to you. Thank, Thank you. Lovely to chat. You're a good interviewer. Yeah. Oh, good on you. <laughs> you got a future.